Welcome back. Best known for his unrivaled, unapologetic, and brilliant sports analysis, ESPN and sports media icon Stephen A. Smith is unveiling another side of himself with his new series. Stephen A.'s World, the on-demand weeknight series exclusively on ESPN Plus, brings fans, well, inside Stephen's world and the unique stories that matter to him most. And joining me now to talk more about the new project, sports and so much more, is none other than the legend, Stephen A. Smith, my brother, it's <laughs> always good to see you. My brother, what's going on, man? It's good to see you. I'm proud of you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you, man. You've always been such a big support, man. You know, this is one of those businesses where it's supposed to be competitive and they want people to be pitted against each other, man. And the thing that I've always loved and appreciated about you, and I want to say in public is, you ain't never been about that. You knew what was for you was for you. And when you saw younger cats coming up, you support them, you look out for them, you find opportunities for them, you give advice, man. And so many people don't do that, that people need to know just how good a brother you are to all of us, man. Well, I, I appreciate that, man. You know, ain't no fun being at the top or near the top all by, all by yourself, man. If you ain't doing something to help others, man, what purpose are you really, really serving? So that's always the mentality uh, that I had. And it's, it's just great to see a brother like yourself doing what you're doing because obviously it's a much needed voice. So I'm really proud of you and I'm really happy for you. Oh, thank you, man. Now, talking about this new show, Stephen A's World, what can we expect to get from this show that we don't get from the other 50 jobs you got? Well, first of all, I'm not debating. It's my show. Um, I'm hosting and, and really more so than anything else, uh, Mark, it's really about me just trying to bring a bit of uh, a levity to just just the life in sports and, and pop culture and beyond and also intertwining sports and pop culture in a more flagrant fashion. I'm unapologetic about the fact that even though I have my aspirations behind the camera, I am the executive producer of this show. My production company, Mr. SAS Productions, which I just started about six months ago, uh, this show is being done in concert with ESPN. So obviously I've got my aspirations behind the camera to produce content scripted and unscripted series documentaries docu-series things of that nature but also in front of the camera I actually have an aspiration to host late night someday um, I think that since Arsenio Hall has departed from network television late night I think that's a gap that needs to be filled and I think that it's not that you want to alienate anybody but there's so much talent that's coming from our community, that's emanating from our community, that I think uh, is starving to be celebrated for the greatness that they disseminate. And if I have an opportunity to assist in that regard in a very, very significant way, it's something that I really, really have a passion to do. And so I'm hoping that this is just the first step towards ultimately achieving that goal where someday when you're looking at Jimmy Kimmel, Stephen Gobert, Jimmy Fallon, someday you'll see Stephen A. Smith's name in that mix for late night television. And this is the this is the starting point for that for me. No, I, I love that idea. And I think you fit in perfectly because you were able to talk across a lot of areas. One of the challenges that mm -hmm. athletes face is when they try to talk outside of a certain area, if it's not what the general public wants, they say stay in your lane. Do you ever worry or even get frustrated when people tell you focus on basketball or focus on sports and don't talk about these other things going on in the world? No, because I just ignore them because I don't think that they're paying attention to what I do. And you've known me for years, so you'll testify to what I'm about to say. I know what I don't know. What I don't know, I'm the kind of person that points you in the direction of people that do know more. I'm unapologetic about that. A lot of times when I'm going throughout this country and I'm giving lectures or I'm giving speeches on the speaking circuit and what have you, I use, I, I religiously use this one line. I'm brilliant because I know I'm not. I listen to those who are, mm. I learn from them. And more importantly, I learn when to hand it to them to let them take it to another level. And I think that people that would try to say something like that to me in terms of limiting myself to sports, first of all, I pride myself in being a bit more intelligent and knowing a bit more than sports. But more importantly than that, that doesn't mean that I know everything. And I'm quick to acknowledge I don't know everything. But I might know enough to point somebody in the direction of a Mark Lamont Hill. I might know enough to point somebody in the direction of somebody else. It could be a Karen Hunter. It could be a Joe Madison. The litany of individuals from our community who are brilliant, brilliant people, highly intellectual. You just interviewed Mr. Stephen Rogers and look at that great book that he's that he's written about. So when you want to talk about black wealth in this nation or the lack thereof, 
that's somebody that you might need to talk to. You want a history lesson. You might want to talk to Dr. Harry Edwards. You might want to get down with Dr. Uh, Michael Eric Dyson and others. The fact that I know these people or know about these people, but I have the platform that I have where millions of people are watching me, listening to me and hearing me speak every single day. It's me saying, okay, there's a limit to what I know, but I know somebody who might know more. You should go listen to them. That's my job, a conduit to things and to people of that ilk. And that is the role that I serve. So I completely ignore people who tell me to limit myself because they're not listening to me. I'm not trying to act like I'm the period. I'm where you stop for knowledge. I'm never trying to be that person because there's always more for others to learn from someone else. Lately, there's been a push in the last few years uh, for athletes to say more. There's been a bigger platform for them to do more. Uh, we're looking at a generation of basketball players in particular who have spoken out perhaps more than the eras prior. How much of that is about athletes becoming more political and more conscious? And how much of that is just them having more freedom and space to say what athletes have always thought? Well, I think it's the combination of those two things, but I'll add a third element to it all, their own communities. Because when you come from a community, okay, particularly the black community, I tell this to white folks all the time, y'all go to work every day with a job to do. We show up with a responsibility. Your community is not looking at you and something jumps up that's totally unrelated to your occupation, your, your career. And, and people from your community are telling you, you better talk about this. You got to touch on that. You can't ignore this. You got to address that. But we hear that all the time as black people, because by and large, black people have been relatively voiceless. And so the few that have, ever, that have been able to penetrate that proverbial glass ceiling per se, and get themselves to a place where they have a platform that can disseminate a message to the masses. The fact is, there's immense pressure on us at least to make sure the voices of the voiceless are heard in some capacity. And I think that what you're seeing from the modern day athlete, yeah, they've got their social media uh, reach and their platform. Yeah, they're professional athletes. They've got gobs and gobs of money. All of that is true. But they still come from a community that's saying to them all the time, don't forget about us. Don't forget about us. And I think that because of their reach and because of their cachet, it does come with a strong degree of pressure for, to them to make sure that they try to give a voice to the voiceless and speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. And I think that's what you're seeing a lot of athletes, why you're seeing a lot of athletes speak up and speak out the way that they have. Stephen A., before you go, can you just do me one favor? I know you plugged into the NBA very well. You know a lot of the players. Can you ask the New York Knicks to stay right at that number four seed for me? My Sixers, I think we're going to come away with the one seed. I think that we're we going to win the first round. I'd love to have your Knicks at number four so we can get right to the Eastern Finals. Man, I'm feeling lucky, man. I'm feeling like we might got a pathway to the Finals, man. Can you make that happen for me? Well, first of all, let's understand a couple of things here. I worked in Philadelphia for 17 years, as you well know. I covered the 76ers for many years. Still got a lot of friends within the organization. I ain't hating on them at all. Love Doc Rivers. Love a lot of people that work for the organization. But I'm a New York, and I'm a Knicks fan. And I'm incredibly, incredibly excited at what I'm seeing because for the first time in 20-plus years, they are actually relevant. They're nine games above 500. They've won about three in a row. They won 12 of their last 13. They're legitimately a top four seed. Now, the Sixers are a better team because Embiid is a candidate. He's been a monster this year. He's a candidate for league MVP honors. Ben Simmons is a candidate for defensive player of the year honors. He definitely would get that award in my mind. And the Sixers should beat them. But here's the difference. The Knicks are playing with house money. Just making it to the playoffs, let alone winning a first-round series, is butter. If the Sixers don't make it to the finals, your season's a failure. So you're under more pressure than the Knicks are. As a result, it could potentially cost y'all, and we'll see what happens. But if the New York Knicks make it to a second-round series, whether it's against Philly or if against Brooklyn, as long as they show up and are competitive, I'm going to be very, very proud of them because it's significantly more than I ever expected for them. Whereas with you, your Sixers, you know y'all were hoping for a berth to the NBA Finals. And I don't see that happening as long as the big three in Brooklyn are healthy. Woo! I wish if we had more time, I would break down why I think we can squeeze by that big three. I'm not even sure all three going to be there by the time they get to the Eastern Finals or where they're limping oh, around no, these days. But I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. You'll beat them if all three ain't there. You'll beat them if all three ain't there. But if all three of them are there, it's a wrap for you. You ain't going. You, you going home. Going home. If all three are healthy, Yo. it's a wrap. You Yo. ain't beating them. Don't.
those words are immortalized, y'all. Y'all heard this, so it's going to be recorded. So if we play them in the Eastern Finals, and it's the big three against our big two, two or three, however you think about Tobias Harris. I love him. I think he's great. If that's what it is, I say the Sixers win in seven. Surprise the world, man. Muhammad Ali style. If Stephen A, man, I got to run, but it's so good to have you on the show, man. Everybody, make sure you check out Stephen A's world every single night on ESPN+. Plus. Stay with us. We got much more coming up right now.